Welcome to this uh, virtual seminar series on transnational collaboration and lifelong learning, looking back and looking forward. It is the first um, seminar series to follow on from the launch of our Insight paper, which we launched um, earlier this month. And it is looking at a central aspect of the way in which higher education is being transformed. Society is changing as a, at, at a rapid pace. The ways in which we need to learn and the, 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 the technologies that we need to master uh, change during the courses of our lifetimes. And this really raises the questions and makes the question very urgent about how we keep up and how we enable our society to keep up with these transformations. Um, it is a particularly important topic as the Commission is, pre uh, is preparing uh, a proposal for a, uh, for a council recommendations on micro-credentials for lifelong learning and employability. And this initiative aims at developing common definition uh, and European standards for quality, transparency and cross-border comparability. And so this is an extremely, not just an extremely urgent topic for the sector, but it is also uh, an extremely timely discussion to have in a European policy context um, as the uh, Commission is, has launched a consultation uh, which is open until the 13th of July uh, 2021 and we urge you all to engage with that consultation, maybe also reflecting on uh, this seminar. Uh, my name is Jan Pomowski. I'm the Secretary General of the Guild of European Research Intensive Universities. I'm delighted to welcome a really wonderful panel. But at the background of this panel is a paper that we produced and that, um, that re reflect a year's worth of discussion within the Guild. Um, and that was really written by Joanne Guri, the lead author who's here with us today, uh, but also um, Arne Valk, uh, Vice Rector from uh, the University of Tartu, Berit Aika, Vice Rector of Aarhus University, and Karen Amos, uh, from, uh, Vice Rector of the University of Tübingen. Without further ado, um, I would like to pass the word, hand the word now to Joanne Guri. But we've, before I do so, I would just like to um, um, re remind you that we have launched a Padlet. Um, we have shared the, um, the web address for the Padlet um, with you um, before the seminar. So please have a look at there. We're also sh uh, sharing the, um, the link to the Padlet in the Q&A session of the seminar. Please post your questions and comments and observations on the Padlet, um, but, and we will try and respond to them as best we can in the seminar, or uh, post your questions directly in the Q&A section of this, uh, of this webinar. So without further ado, I'm delighted now to hand the word to uh, John Guri to present today's, um, today's discussion in light of the findings of the inside paper. Joe, the word is yours. Joe, I think you're sound. Of course. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the writing team. Uh, their paper is a product of ongoing collaboration and uh, aspires to start a debate on, on the transformational changes the sector needs and are possible at this moment in time. Uh, the paper responds to the current emphasis of education in the current policy context in line with the 2025 European Education Area and the Digital Education Action Plan and also fundamentally responds to the strong discourse of the need for change that is blowing in the sector, arguing for a new higher education model. In proposing a framework and intervention on research-led education, we summarize the key themes we address in the paper in six areas, which are interrelated and also allow us to tackle them individually. We start today the dialogue by turning to the timely and very relevant topic of lifelong learning in the current policy context, and in relation to the potential of transnational collaboration, hence also probing on the value added of international partnerships. Universities are actively encouraged by national and international policymakers to diversify the portfolio of learning opportunities available to students and revisit the current dominant models of delivering their higher education pedagogical offerings. In line with the growing discourse of Industry 4.0 and its emphasis on the implications of digitalization, future of work, artificial intelligence, uh, universities are uh, prompted uh, to turn to lifelong learning and work with different academic and non-academic stakeholders in responding to changing demographics, the changing global workplace, as the dynamic societal landscapes around us. 
undoubtedly the profile of our students is changing. The model student who can spend three to five years on full-time education and independent means straight from school uh, can no longer or soon uh, will no longer be considered the norm. Graduates who currently need or desire up or reskilling towards re-employment, career change due to personal circumstances need to negotiate and balance family and work responsibilities uh, with a physical attendance to courses, accessing finance, uh, making study, uh, making time to study over the period of degree programs, or negotiate uh, a complex landscape of short-term courses and uh, different providers. The graphs on the slide uh, illustrate, uh, illustrate a well-known reality. I'm not going to go through them in detail. They just aim to show variety, multiplicity, and resilience of barriers that survey participants over the years have been reported in relation to participating in lifelong learning. While various open courses are available, there is often little direction and guidance as to how to engage in building coherence and a cohesive overall learning experience. And of course, we know from research on MOOCs uh, that uh, this is not in and by itself the solution to lifelong learning. One of the challenges for higher education then is to attract and encourage non-traditional uh, adult learners, lifelong learners to participate, but importantly, how we make opportunity primarily designed for full-time degree, traditional degree students available to all learners. Traditional programs are not designed for lifelong learning, but are designed having a total university experience uh, while providing a holistic education uh, in short formats uh, is a considerable pedagogical challenge with no easy solutions. These issues have been documented. However, the disruption uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has accelerated the need for rethinking relationships between the sector uh, the sector and edtech, policymakers and industry in the EU and beyond. Uh, the ongoing pressures on the economy and changes in the global landscape are expected to put more pressure on the need for fast up or reskilling. This is not new uh, and uh, lifelong learning, the significance of lifelong learning at times of crisis, lifelong learning models have been debated over at least the last 70 years. Um, so the issue is what needs to change now in order to be able to meet the policy brief, uh, the aspiration, establish alternative pathways, provide multiple format benefits for multiple modalities that we now have at our disposal alongside traditional degrees. In this context, universities need to strike the right balance between providing for long and short term societal needs and to respond to regional, national and international priorities. Training for the present is not, by definition, a future-proof model. In the disruptive environment of the 21st century, it is impossible to educate students for the future on the basis of the past. It is possible, however, and this is what research-intensive universities do and can do very well, to use evidence and prepare for change. Universities need to train for a mindset, for inspiring creativity, exciting curiosity, challenging learners, allowing, allowing time to try, fail, try again, succeed, uh, explore something new. A problem solving, a global attitude, rather than either trying to predict a future that will constantly change or narrowly focus on the skills for the jobs of today. The need and opportunity for flexibility and creativity in formats and pathways, therefore, uh, should not come at the expense of future-looking, research-informed, coherent learning experiences. Current policy frameworks aim to provide tools to meet this challenge. The European University Initiative is a potential tool towards this direction. It is producing promising first results and seem to give the potential to partner institutions to become gateways to global connected learning communities. We need to articulate what this means, the value it brings and the support it needs. It is an experiment. If successful, it will need to be properly supported to move from a pilot to implementation, from an experiment to the mainstream. And this is particularly relevant to work uh, in piloting and experimenting with alternatives as is the case uh, with microcredits. So work on micro-credentials is very important uh, for the, the, in the context of our conversation today. And again, all is new and questions such as the ones on the slide go to the core of academic practice. There has been consistent and growing interest in unbundling credit and moving beyond the traditional degree of the past 15 years. 
uh, the need for a diverse ecology, learning ecology or credentialing ecology uh, is, is, is argued, is documented. Uh, alternative credentials typically refer to micro-credentials, but also digital badges, certificates, industry-led certificates are common. Uh, the landscape is highly diverse. There is significant work, the European Commission will hear more shortly, OECD establishing debating definitions, you see one on the slide, and quality assurance uh, frameworks. These developments capitalize on a discourse suggesting that new forms of credentialing are necessary for upskilling, financially affordable education, and the hard the gist of lifelong learning, giving independence of choice, agency to the learner. Questions, however, still remain open and need to be debated. Zooming out of microcredits and back to lifelong learning, the position we take is that as universities with a tradition, with long-standing tradition in research-led education, we are significantly involved and can and should lead at least part of the lifelong learning agenda, particularly uh, by experimenting with innovative pedagogies, which allow us to provide less rigidity, uh, but transcend boundaries between routes and pathways that are available to our students, uh, introduce innovative ways to bundle learning outcomes or provide specific and specialized uh, upskilling and reskilling learning activities for advanced lifelong learners, uh, all based on state-of-the-art research. Research-intensive institutions, however, are not the sole providers of courses, nor should they be. Our vision is for universities to capitalize on the current disruption to retain all the things we do well and improve what we can do better to serve the needs of all our learners and of students uh, and the dynamic societal landscape around us. Universities have solid expertise to build on and lead on the change that is required and is possible. This, however, does not mean that all research intensive institutions would uh, or should provide all types of formats or pathways. And universities are not a homogeneous category anyway. We're diverse, serve diverse regional, national communities, student cohorts, and so on. There has been a lot of discussion about the future of university, the future of learning, what could and should look like. This is not new from different providers with different agendas and with different voices. In that context, higher education and ed tech are positioned on an either or on a binary. And in our paper, we're, we're in our paper, we're trying to transcend and challenge binaries, and this is uh, one of them. We claim we position ourselves that universities are not in competition with ed tech uh, or commercial providers. Why, why would we be? Uh, we have different roles and orientation. We need, however, an open and deep dialogue on the best ways to work together in a symbiotic relationship and contribute to the wider ecosystem. Last point, this level of change cannot be delivered without support, establishing alternative pathways, redesigning curricula. We've all experienced that over the past 14, 16 months now, using and drawing multiple modalities, moving beyond the on offline binary to the post digital university with flexible technology at our disposal is, is the way forward, but it is also resource intensive. Support in the form of resource and recognition, as we all know, remains what we often we don't talk about, uh, or at least not as much as we should when pedagogic innovation is on the table. And we will all have experienced educational change to rely on the generosity of spirit and time of those who take on large portfolio on top of regular workload. This, however, this model is not commensurate with the vision and the opportunity for deep qualitative change. Uh, which uh, and now needs to balance different tensions. So at an institutional level, costs need to be balanced, which are associated with digitalization, while at the same time, budgets are decreasing. And also we all know that staff are under, are under a lot of pressure uh, to, to cover the daily needs of the pro profession and therefore uh, with very little or no capacity for strategic redesign, taking on extra work and so on. So we require top level support, which will bring together the policy framework for education, for teaching and learning uh, with the vision for reimagining research led education and the appropriate funding models for education innovation. So to close, uh, we have summarized uh, our paper's core messages in the video. You can find the full version uh, online and on the Padlet uh, that we are co-creating. Uh, but I will now share the part that encapsulates the issues I've touched upon and we're debating today. Two, 
research-led universities should lend their distinctive strengths to lifelong learning. Digitalization is among the most powerful forces of societal and economic transformation, requiring more and more people to learn new skills throughout their adult lives. Universities need to strengthen their engagement with lifelong learning and the emphasis on flexible designs. Developing micro-credentials that are recognized across the center and beyond could be an important start. But universities must not compromise on their core mission of educating for active citizenship and long-term societal growth and well-being. Universities must be enabled to respond to this challenge according to their own strengths, notwithstanding the need for harmonization. What does change look like for your institution? How can universities build on their strengths to embrace transformation in new ways? Join us and be part of the conversation. Thank you very much, so, uh, Joe. Uh, so, Sorry. So, one, one second, I promise. I promise I want to keep the floor. So just to say that the conversation has started. Uh, we are hearing it together uh, and we're embarking on the journey through the seminar series that we have now successfully launched. The next seminar is taking place on the 23rd September of September on the very important topic on systems that enable us to be creative uh, and do not stifle innovation. Uh, we have an exciting uh, lineup uh, and, and series, a full seminar series plan, which we'll also announce very soon. Uh, and on that, uh, I will close uh, with, um, with and, and leave you with a seminar. Uh, as a start, uh, let us work together to sketch a roadmap to change, to change so that transformation and evolution and revolution in education and teaching and learning does not remain an aspiration and a high level vision. Uh, but we work together to make it a reality in our institutions. Thanks, Jan, and uh, back to you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we already have first questions coming in from the from the Padlet, and uh, maybe that could also be something that uh, Rajay could could reflect on uh, when when uh, we will discuss these issues with him. But for now, I would like to invite Kuhn uh, Kuh Nomden um, from the uh, Director General of Empl for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion at the European Commission. Um, and Clara Engels Pereni um, from the uh, Higher Education Unit of uh, DG Education of the, of the Director General of Education and Culture from the European Commission to uh, to join the floor. Um, Kuhn, um, you are you are there as we have two Claras, but you are in fact Kuhn, so that's uh, that's great. Um, but uh, thank you so much for joining us. And can I maybe just start with you? Um, it would be, could could you? I mean, from your from the perspective of the Director General for Employment. Um, could you just explain your Director General's uh, work on the lifelong learning agenda? Why is this important um, to you? Um, and based on the experience of the pandemic, what are the next priorities of the Commission that the sector should be aware of? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I had some difficulties uh, joining the meeting, so I'm joining from my uh, phone, but I hope you, you can hear and I believe you can also see me. Um, yeah, so I mean, DG employment within the European Commission is the DG that is responsible for skills policy in general, and uh, skills policy in general means skills policies, uh, you know, independent from, from the level or from the type of, of, of education training. So it's really looking at it from a uh, skills uh, perspective. Now, we also have uh, prepared a few uh, slides. And if you go to the next one, you can already see why um, the EU has been uh, working and the Commission, I would say, at large, because um, even if DG Employment is responsible for skills, the work on skills is done at the level of uh, the Commission because it covers so many different policy aspects as well. And the reason why the Commission came up with the skills agenda on the 1st of July of last year is to really to adapt uh, to the green transition, the digital transition, to go for the skills that are needed for these transitions. And then of course, because we were already preparing for the skills agenda, but then COVID-19 came and of course uh, completely changed uh, the context. And now the skills agenda needs to be seen also in this broader reform uh, context. Now, if we look at the landscape, we have a couple of problems. Yeah, 20% of 
pupils at schools are underperforming and there are 60 million low qualified adults within the EU. And also we have 44% of the population, adult population without basic digital skills. So these are some of the problems that through uh, skills policies, the commission tries uh, to tackle. And as I said, these skills policies are broad in nature. They cover, of course, the whole economy, but they do not focus on a particular type or level of uh, education and training. Also related to this, and this is on the next slide, uh, there are a number of targets yeah, uh, by 2025 and by 2030. And, and the idea is that by 2025, 50% of adults should take place, uh, should take part in learning, 60% in 2030. Now, the only question you can have here is, does really, uh, is really all learning captured? Also, you know, informal, if I do just uh, courses uh, and I don't notify anybody, Okay, so it's probably a bit more the, the structured part of learning. Then 30% uh, of low qualified adults, because there is a real problem. We hope that they should also uh, take part in, in, in learning. And also 20% of uh, people that recently have been unemployed. And then the digital skills, the basic digital skills target is 80% in 2030 and 70 in 2020. So we believe that these objectives are very important. Now, what is um, important in this context as well is that I said the commission is working as a whole. We are DG employment, but we work closely together with DG education and culture, but also with other DGs, with DG Connect, that is responsible for digital skills, with DG and, and, and environment and climate that, that relate to, to, to the green skills, skills for the green transition, but also DG Grow. And on this slide, you see the different initiatives that were taken on European level. And that actually all, all linked together because um, there is a skills agenda I already mentioned, but also last year was adopted the European education area and to be achieved by 2025, the digital education action plan with a focus on digital education, also on digital skills. Then earlier this year, and the commission adopted uh, the communication on the digital decade with the aim to you know achieve the yeah excellence but also a big mass regarding digital skills european green deal also i would like to uh, pay attention to the european pillar of social rights that uh, had the first principle on uh, on lifelong learning that is uh, that is key and an action plan was adopted earlier this year and also endorsed by heads of state and, uh, and government. If we go to the next one, we see here the building blocks and the actions of the European uh, skills agenda. So it has uh, actually four uh, building blocks, namely uh, joining forces. So it's really based on different forces, government, social partners to join up, to join together, to work together on uh, yeah, improving uh, the skills uh, landscape for the, for the future. Secondly, uh, a block is related to uh, skilling for a job uh, with different initiatives, including skills to support uh, trend transitions under which also the digital skills are falling. And then there are the tools for lifelong learning. Uh, so the commission is working on initiatives uh, regarding an individual learning account micro-credentials, Europass. And in our joint presentation, we will zoom in uh, on the ones that are in red. And of course, there is the unlocking investment building block as well with the recovery and resilience fund and all the other funds that were also um, yeah, adopted for the for the seven year period uh, in which we uh, entered. And Clara will, of course, more specifically focus on the micro-credentials and I will zoom in to some of the other uh, actions. So first of all, uh, regarding the Pact for Skills. So the Pact for Skills um, really has the intention of bringing the major players in, in industrial ecosystems to bring them together, also with public authorities to create large partnerships of you know, uh, working together to achieve concrete investments uh, in upskilling opportunities for employees. Um, also, uh, it's focusing on upskilling and reskilling of all people of working age. Apprenticeships, it's focusing on all types of skills, not just vocational skills. I mean, it, it considers all. Uh, it considers all skills. 
And uh, yeah, we hope that this uh, partnership will, will give some, some boost. Uh, there are already large scale multi stakeholder e ecosystem partnerships that were, um, that were agreed, namely in the automotive sector, and in the microelectronics sector, aerospace sector, in aerospace ambition, for example, is to upskill 6% of the workforce each year. So every year reaching 200,000 people with 1 billion uh, investment over the next 10 years. And also uh, we have to stress the individual commitments by, uh, by companies and by, by stakeholders. So, so far uh, close to 400 signatories have joined the Pact for Skills. This includes big companies like Siemens, Nestle, Microsoft, but also uh, some universities, vet providers, public employment services. And uh, yeah, through this, um, there is commitment to concrete actions. Just mentioning one example, European Welding Federation plans to support training for 100,000 workers in additive manufacturing by 2030. Now, if you go to the next slide, we see a focus on the digital skills. So there the problem that we have is that um, one out of four people in the workforce have low levels of digital skills and there is a need for big data analysts 500,000 300,000 cybersecurity experts and these are at the moment uh, missing and you see uh, things go very fast and new profiles are emerging there at the same time 64 percent of companies report that they have difficulties in recruiting um yeah the right uh, specialist in ACT if we go to the next one we see here the targets of the digital decade, as already mentioned, 80% uh, of the population should have at least basic digital skills, uh, but also there is a need for 20 million ICT specialists, including data uh, specialists. And also 75% of European companies should have taken up cloud computing services, big data, artificial intelligence. And also there is a focus in particular on SME. If we go now to the individual learning account, um, this is one of the uh, two initiatives together with micro credentials for which currently um, uh, open public consultation is still there. It will soon close, but it's still possible to reply to it. Why is the commission coming up with this? This is because there is a growing need to update skills throughout working life, but insufficient participation of adults. And and um, in this particular context, we should remind that four out of 10 workers currently have an atypical form of work. So they are not covered, let's say, by the traditional collective agreements based uh, training, uh, training facilities. Uh, and um, so the, the initiative is also very much focused on this. Also, workers face an increasing number of labor market uh, transitions. There are multiple barriers to uh, participation, financial, non-financial. And uh, there is a need to complement what employers do already now. So there is, of course, no intention to replace what employers do already now. If you move to the next one, possible building blocks of the initiative are cost sharing, additional uh, skills investments, uh, yeah, target groups, um, guidance and outreach to, to low qualified adults. Validation also will be important here. Um, because if you have already learned something, why do again a, a course is better to get your skills uh, validated. And also it tries to uh, address um, time constraints and tackle these. And of course, one issue that will need careful reflection is also the quality and labor market relevance of the training offer, because you need to avoid that you have all kinds of parties that offer training that is not so trustworthy. We can move to the next one. And this is uh, the Europass initiative. I quickly wanted to present it to you and then uh, I will give the floor to Clara. Also on the 1st of July of last year, Europass as the European platform for lifelong learning and career management was launched by the commission. So tomorrow we are celebrating one year of Europass. And Europass exists since 2004 and was basically a CV uh, template tool, but it has now been transformed into a tool with an e-portfolio where you can, of course, I mean, make your skills profile uh, and which also offers uh, CV templates and, and templates for uh, letters, but also more importantly, and this will be 
important in particular in the future it will provide you with skills yeah uh, profiling and also with course suggestions for example or you can directly apply to jobs from europass because it is linked to the urs um urs portal where public employment services exchange vacancies now apart from this e-portfolio with career goals learning goals mobility and opportunities to find jobs and courses i would like to draw attention to the fact that we are working on setting a standard for digital credentialing which is called now europass digital credentials maybe we will rename it into european digital credentials and thirdly, also you can find information on uh, yeah, all sorts of things, including also uh, qualifications, which is good for employers if they want to check uh, qualification of an applicant. So this was my part of the story. Okay, uh, most of which was DG employment led, but not everything. And now I pass the floor to Clara for um, the uh, presentation part concerning micro credentials. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we heard from uh, the presentations both by Joe and both by uh, Kuhn that uh, there is a big need for uh, uh, training uh, in general for uh, for upskilling and reskilling and uh, uh, higher education institutions uh, are uh, could also play uh, an important role uh, as providers uh, for this training and um, we had uh, just a few weeks ago a ministerial uh, debate uh, about uh, uh, this topic how um, developments in in the different member states of the eu are uh, reflecting uh, on, uh, on this uh, need and in particular whether micro credentials uh, shorter courses than full degrees would have a place uh, in the uh, uh, in the education and training systems of uh, of the member states and we heard from uh, ministers really unan unanimously that they are all uh, having this discussion at uh, na national level uh, so this is uh, actually a very good opportunity for uh, for uh, the guild members members to uh, engage into, in, in, in these discussions at national level, while at the same time at European level we also need to do uh, things together. Because um, uh, what we heard also from ministers that many of them are waiting for EU level developments uh, in order to see uh, what would be the definition of micro credentials, for example, and uh, uh, before having a, a joint uh, definition, they wouldn't want to uh, uh, set in stone development in their own country. And, and this is also very important to have uh, a convergent uh, view on, uh, on micro credentials. And uh, last year, uh, the European Commission started uh, in a smaller uh, working group where also some of uh, some guild members participated uh, to define uh, what we understand under micro credentials in the European context and you can see uh, this uh, draft uh, definition uh, on uh, the screen uh, uh, and and this is the basis for uh, for all uh, the work we are doing currently uh, on micro credentials uh, we are still uh, uh, consulting uh, the wide public on, on this uh, definition. And uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to come up with a proposal for a council recommendation by the end of this year, which would also include uh, uh, this, uh, not this, but a definition. And, uh, and this is our proposal. And, uh, and we will see, just if you could go back a little bit, uh, I would like uh, to uh, highlight just a very few aspects of this definition. Uh, this definition is uh, valid for all uh, learning contexts, not only for higher education, but all fields of education and uh, training, including non-formal and informal learning. This is why we are using, uh, uh, for example, the expression uh, short learning experience. But a micro credential would show the uh, uh, results of, of the learning outcomes of, 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 a, of, of a shorter learning. Uh, which uh, has been assessed. And this assessment uh, is uh, also a very important uh, aspect, uh, which is needed for the trust uh, in, in micro-credentials. They are less than a full degree uh, and a qualification, but they are still more than 
the fulfillment of a, of a simple course. So uh, this assessment examination at the end uh, is rather important. Um, and also the, um, the second part of the definition goes more into the technical uh, elements. Uh, on the next slide, you can, you can see this a little bit in, uh, in more detail. Um, these are, uh, this would be uh, the European standard for, uh, for different elements which should be shown on, on a micro-credential. And a, a micro-credential would be basically a, a certificate, we expect in, in most cases a digital one, uh, which uh, would give information about the learner, about the provider, about the whole learning context and what the learner has acquired during, uh, during this learning. And, uh, and uh, the group, the, the expert group uh, proposed uh, these elements as, as the basis. And uh, uh, we hope that uh, by setting this uh, as a standard, we, will, we would also increase uh, the recognition for, uh, for micro-credentials. Uh, what uh, I, I would like to highlight a very few uh, important aspects uh, in, uh, in, in this regard. For example, uh, the stackability, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, very often uh, debated uh, co uh, connected to micro-credentials. Uh, it is uh, useful if this smaller chunks of learning uh, can, be, can build upon each other and can be combined to bigger uh, credentials. And what we hear from, from the stakeholders that uh, this is uh, indeed a very valuable aspect of micro-credentials, but combining them into full degrees should not uh, be possible because this is something what uh, uh, higher education institutions uh, are doing on, on the basis of uh, very thorough uh, mapping of, uh, of uh, competencies and uh, learning outcomes. And uh, this, this should not be um, taken over fully by the individual. Uh, another important aspect is uh, the credits. In higher education, credits help uh, the combination and, and, and stackability of, uh, of micro-credentials. So basically, it is, uh, uh, having credits assigned to micro-credentials is useful for the learner, is useful for the institution. But the big question is uh, how many credits uh, should, uh, be, should belong uh, to the uh, category of micro credentials, and here uh, we we got the uh, until now uh, the feedback that uh, it is better to leave flexibility uh, to allow very small micro credentials from one ECTS up to almost a full degree, uh, because uh, institutions need uh, some time to experiment with uh, with this new uh, not really new phenomenon but uh, uh, with with micro credentials as, as a new uh, term and, and and to see how their provisions uh, would fit uh, best uh, under micro credentials so here we are we are still uh, um, thinking whether this very flexible approach would uh, ensure uh, the um, transparency and 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 clarity, uh, uh, which is needed, or uh, if we should uh, define uh, a certain credit range for micro credentials. So your feedback would be really uh, important and welcome uh, for us. And uh, probably the most crucial aspect of micro credentials, which comes up uh, really uh, each time, is quality, quality assurance. How can we include? Uh, um, micro credentials into provision which is uh, uh, trusted and uh, and here in, in the case of higher education institutions i think the uh, re response can be rather simple as long as micro credential the courses leading to micro credentials are included in the internal quality assurance of institutions uh, the, they they should be uh, uh, regarded as a trusted uh, content, uh, while it gets a little bit more uh, complicated when uh, higher education institutions are uh, uh, not the providers, but uh, uh, the providers are from uh, from outside the educa formal education and uh, training system or uh, private providers. And uh, and here uh, there is uh, still a big discussion whether uh, whether we. Uh, what kind of uh, system we could uh, set up, which is attractive uh, for private providers and uh, and uh, uh, helps uh, uh, to uh, 
broaden micro credentials also for them. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, which doesn't uh, favor them uh, too much, uh, uh, contrary to higher education institutions. So a good balance between uh, between ensuring uh, ensuring the quality and trust, but also uh, giving the possibility of, uh, of 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 having micro uh, having uh, also um, non formal uh, providers um, uh, in 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 the systems and. Um, here, probably uh, higher education institutions could play uh, an important mediator role because uh, for, 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 for courses, and we see it very much uh, in uh, the case of European universities alliances, it is uh, very useful if institutions can work together with other uh, players from their uh, broader ecosystem uh, and offer courses together. And in that case, uh, we would expect that the quality measures of the uh, higher education institution would also include uh, the parts which are uh, which are offered by um, by the um, non formal uh, uh, provider uh, and 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 this uh, partnership uh, between the two uh, seems uh, for us a, a very interesting uh, uh, experimentation and also a road which uh, a path uh, which would, we would like to see uh, developing also from uh, uh, from European universities alliances but more widely from higher education institutions uh, in general as well and uh, let me finish with a few thoughts on uh, on this uh, um, uh, slide which shows that yes we have uh, a lot of technical aspects uh, uh, connected to micro-credentials, but we also have uh, uh, the technological part, which uh, will be covered uh, in, the, in the next uh, presentation. But also, uh, we need to, uh, to think uh, really broadly uh, in, in, a, in policy uh, uh, terms, what, do we, what would we like to see uh, to be developed through micro credentials, what aspect of uh, of our education and training system should uh, should uh, improve uh, through micro credentials? Micro credentials are really obvious for upskilling and reskilling, and this is where we see uh, that uh, it's take uh, that take up uh, is. Uh, um, is expected to be uh, the biggest in, in higher education, uh, uh, but the element of inclusion uh, should also not be uh, forgotten. Um, and this is uh, probably a little bit more challenging uh, in general. It is less attractive for, uh, for higher education institutions to, uh, to engage in, uh, in, in, uh, in courses which uh, would probably connect, uh, offer easier transition from uh, VET uh, or schools to higher education. Uh, or, or offer more flexible courses for, for current students uh, um, because uh, the upskilling and reskilling of adults is, is, is much easier to, uh, put, uh, to be put in place. Uh, but uh, we uh, also think that these are areas uh, where uh, we should not, uh, not be forgotten. And it, below, it, it is very strongly linked to the uh, question of costing. Uh, who pays uh, for the development of micro credentials and who pays uh, uh, the fees? Uh, we are uh, conducting together with the OECD, with the help of the OECD, uh, uh, currently um, some uh, uh, study uh, looking for evidence of what is uh, what is out there, what is uh, existing already. Uh, in the area of, of micro credentials, and there, there we see that the, um, for uh, the con continuous learning uh, spectrum, uh, life, um, um, micro credentials courses leading to micro credentials are usually connected to full costing. So uh, participants pay uh, the full uh, cost, but uh, this could be a barrier for uh, for some learners. And uh, and here we would also need to see whether uh, uh, some uh, uh, 
national auto, national authorities could also uh, in, intervene and, and support uh, learners uh, in need, or how could, could the employers uh, take a, a bigger role? And here, uh, the link to what Kuhn uh, mentioned about the individual learning accounts uh, comes in, or vouchers or entitlements uh, could be also uh, seen as, as possible options to, uh, to reach out to a wider uh, range of learners and to all who cannot uh, afford it. Um, and uh, in a, uh, in currently, we are in the process of, of, uh, of a wider consultation, and we would like to invite you to, if not done yet, uh, 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 um, contribute uh, to this, where we uh, ask uh, participants about the definition, but also some wider uh, aspects connected to micro-credentials. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Clara and Kuhn. There's clearly a huge amount of go uh, amount going on, not just an amount of thinking, but also some very practical action to, to um, uh, create uh, more opportunities for adult learners through uh, micro credentials is clearly a priority. Uh, Rajay, um, if I may ask you to, to come along and um, you are, um, um, you are right in the middle of this um, in education technology. You are the chief uh, exec officer for skilled education um, in your current um, company, but also before you've worked with um, universities like the LSE, um, the University of Exeter, a whole host of other universities. So you're right. So, and, and as you've heard, there's clearly a lot of, a lot of tailwind, um, not just in the UK, but also across uh, Europe. Can I just ask you maybe for some reflections on really how education technology and universities um, come together in this space, maybe also reflecting on some of the comments that you've seen already in the chat, just also to encourage everybody who's, who's um, participating here um, to keep posting uh, comments in the chat and questions. Rajay. Absolutely. Uh, Jan, colleagues, good morning. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, I, I've kind of torn up my script. I think that what Joe and uh, Con and uh, Clara uh, just set out there was incredibly helpful uh, in setting out the context for why we're having this conversation, for why this evolution in learning is taking place at the moment, and the way that our institutions, the way that our funders, the way that our regulators, the way that employers and individual students uh, need to try and respond and uh, adapt to this changing reality. Now, we're changing and we're evolving because of our learners, because of that out, because of those outcomes we're seeking to deliver, because of uh, the really clear context that I think uh, Cohen and, and Joe and Clara set out. Uh, and what I what I think uh, I'll do is to try and just bring some of that together, perhaps, uh, to then frame the Q and A discussion that we'll we'll have following this, um, and to share a couple of additional thoughts about the role that the private sector is playing, that new providers are playing. Uh, and that governments perhaps outside of Europe are playing uh, in this evolution as well. The first thing I'd, I'd share, uh, colleagues, is that we should now think about uh, higher education as being a spectrum of learning. Uh, it, gone are the days when you know, we were simply uh, delivering world-class research, we were delivering full degree programs, often you know, on campus for three years uh, to, to students who are traveling to uh, engage in those learning experiences, we're now moving to a spectrum. And that spectrum means that we have uh, sometimes short courses that are uncredentialed, that are, that are simply certificates or, uh, or, or pure pieces of learning. Sometimes there'll be micro-credentials that uh, acquire credit and that gain credit that can be uh, stackable as, as Clara was just mentioning. Uh, sometimes it will be certificates um, that you know, have very clear uh, cachet uh, in the employment and other uh, areas, sometimes it'll be diplomas and then sometimes it'll be four degree programs. And thinking about it as a spectrum, I think is very, very important for two reasons. Number one, all of us who are engaged in this every day and are passionate about uh, higher education, about uh, learning and teaching, um, yes, of course, um, you know, we're engaged in this discussion and we understand it and we can, you know, really get stuck into it. But if you imagine this from the perspective of a lifelong learner out there, thinking about how do I get the skills that I need for the next job, for the next rung on the ladder. You know, that is a, a huge um, kind of set of considerations that I might not be used to. And so making sense of all of this for the individual learner, for the business, for the uh, regulator is a really important thing that we have to do. The second is that um, we also have to ensure that this is a catalyst of increased access rather than reduced access for learners. And I think Clara was touching on this at the end of her remarks, 
Um, but there is a risk that as we move towards some of these shifts, towards more lifelong learning, towards more shorter credentials, that we actually entrench some of the social disparities that we had before, rather than widen access in the way that I think we'd all want to do and achieve. And so ensuring that there's really clear guidance, ensuring that there's really clear frameworks and funding available, ensuring that there's real understanding of what the different options are and what the benefits of those are, is I think another responsibility that we've all got uh, to seize in this new future. Alongside that, I think we've also got to think about this in the context of COVID and the pandemic and, and what all of us are still living through. Um, and, and my overall assessment of this, um, and we've done a huge amount of research with uh, the range of institutions that we work with, um, is that actually COVID, when you really take a step back, to a certain extent, it's changed nothing. Um, these trends were already going on in December of 2019. The move towards shorter courses, the move towards lifelong learning, the move towards uh, you know, credit transfer frameworks and those sorts of discussions, the move towards uh, employers uh, investing more in the future of their workforces. Um, all of these things were already happening. But COVID is most certainly an accelerant for all of those phenomena. And so I think, and as we think about the post pandemic world, it's important that we think about what's changed, what hasn't changed, but what is simply accelerated. Um, and I think there are three useful lenses through which, to, uh, we, through which we can think about this evolution. The first is in the age of our learners. Um, you know, traditionally, we've thought about learning as being something that we do uh, up until our early 20s. You know, we go through an undergraduate experience, we might go through a postgraduate experience, uh, we might do a bit of additional uh, learning when we come into the workplace, when we're, when we're being inducted into our employer, uh, and then we might have a professional training course at some point, but that was pretty much it. The reason why that is now shifting is because of the data that Cohen set out um, half an hour or so ago. Um, we have an enormous skills gap that is a, a huge issue that all of our economies are facing. And that focuses on two core areas in particular, firstly, digital skills, and secondly, transferable workplace skills. In relation to digital skills, we have never in the last few decades had such a shift in the skills required in our workplaces. There's never been a time when such a small number of skills are needed in such a large number of jobs, in such a large number of industries across every single sector. Um, and we've done extensive research on this, uh, again, with uh, major employment organizations, with IPEDS, uh, with the OECD, with HESA, uh, with a whole range of others. And it's really clear, areas like digital marketing, data analytics, AI machine learning, cybersecurity are in huge demand across every single role, uh, across every industry, across every sector. And that means that we need to focus on those sorts of areas and higher education has a distinctive role to play, as I'll come on to talk about uh, in just a moment. And then secondly, in terms of transferable skills, uh, you know, we've all heard the message for a long time now that, uh, you know, from employers that we get great graduates, they've got brilliant uh, academic rigor, they've got great uh, scholarship, all of those sorts of really important skills. But what I really need are those workplace skills, those employment skills, those transferable skills. How do I deal with problems? How do I deal with teamwork? How do I deal with uh, solving problems across borders? How do I deal with um, the workplace, the leadership, the communication, the teamwork skills that I really need for my organization? And I think that is a really crucial factor that we need to think about. So the age of our learners has changed. And then secondly, the goal of our learners has changed. Uh, and it's moving far more towards some of those areas. Uh, now that doesn't stop the undergraduates and the postgraduates coming through and studying for the, many of the same reasons they've studied for historically for a long time. But it does mean an evolution of the goals that students are studying for. And then the third shift is a change in mode. Traditionally, we have uh, thought about a university experience, thought about a further or higher education experience as being an essentially an, an, an on-campus experience. And that's been the right thing. And by the way, something I should make very clear from the outset is that that will not shift um, from being the major primary mode of delivery, certainly not for the next 10 years. Um, our campuses will still be those great cathedrals of learning um, that I think will deliver 
uh, great change. And Jan, you're right to raise your eyes. For the next 10 years. As that, as that <laughs> comment. Um, the next 10 years is, is absolutely right. And the reason I say that is because no one can predict what is going to come. Um, you know, if we had thought that we'd be having this conversation 10 years ago, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, when, when the small group of us were launching FutureLearn back in 2012, you know, we did not anticipate the shift that would come over the following uh, nine or so years. Um, and so thinking about those modes as essentially the way we like to think about them, online, offline, and in work, um, I think is, is an important part of that evolution. Um, and that should be uh, an option or series of modes where students have choice, students have flexibility to move between different modes of study, but crucially, as I said, um, where, where the on-campus experience remains kind of sacred, if you like. There is nothing like the face-to-face -face experience. Uh, I'm sure all of us would much rather be, uh, you know, in Brussels or in, uh, you know, Paris or in London or wherever else we, we might be for this discussion. There's nothing quite like it. But on-campus and online can be part of the same solution. And online can help us to extend access in really powerful ways. Um, I think a colleague in, uh, in the Padlet or in the chat was mentioning earlier, can we recreate some of those experiences? Can we recreate some of that magic uh, online? We absolutely can. Um, you know, through really powerful synchronous experiences, you can create powerful small group tutorial sessions that have many of the same benefits as, as, we, as we can create on campus through really powerful international opportunities where you can bring people together from different countries in a way that you simply can't do it as efficiently uh, on campus. That is incredibly powerful. And crucially also, you can create really meaningful relationships. Our academics are often surprised when we show and demonstrate how by creating really immersive communities, by delivering really effective assessment via online uh, tools, by creating really powerful videos and tracking the analytics, um, you can deliver some really powerful impact. Right now, we could apply some very simple technology to this conversation, and we could get real-time analytics on what everyone thinks about what, what Rajay is saying, right? Is he talking a load of nonsense or is he saying something interesting? And, and what do I want to learn more about? And, and, and can I try and understand that? Or can I get him to slow down? Or can I get him to kind of talk more about this in a way that you simply can't do in a lecture theater with 300 people kind of sitting in it where it's more difficult to get that real time exchange. Um, we've just trained 1400 academics at the University of Cambridge um, over the last nine months or so. And the feedback from that was incredible. And a massive part of it, one of the biggest bits of feedback that we got was actually no one has taken the time to pause, no one has taken the time to slow down and just walk me through some of these changes that are going on and where some of these technologies are going. You know, very often this conversation is about hyperbole or it's about you know, the extremes of where um, this evolution is going. And actually, you know, a lot of us, um, certainly in the academic community, are anxious. You know, we've been used to a certain model of delivery, we've been used to a certain way of of teaching and learning uh, and, and indeed our research. Um, and this is you know, sometimes very worrying. In addition to that, our universities are stretched. You know, we're, we're stretched when it comes to expertise, we're stretched when it comes to bandwidth, we're stretched when it comes to funding and capital. And so we're not often putting in the resources that are required to do this. You know, is this online thing, just job number 19 on top of the 18 I'm already doing, right? Is, is the kind of message sometimes that we get and where we can actually sit down with institutions and figure out sustainable, efficient, scalable ways of delivering some of this uh, evolution. That's when you get academic communities on board and get them really engaged and positive about some of the things that you can now do um, with, with the shift I'm talking about in terms of age, goal and mode. Um, just a couple of quick things on, on policy and funding, um, just in relation to what um, Clara and colleagues are saying. Um, first is that we need a, a credit transfer framework that is a true framework. Um, you know, right now we have different models across different jurisdictions, across different countries. Um, you know, that ghastly B word um, makes that more difficult uh, with, with, with that. But if we could have a truly flexible um, and portable credit transfer framework, that would really help with the shift towards micro-credentials and truly stackable courses. The second is uh, tuition reimbursement models. Um, this is pretty well established in France. 
pretty well established in the United States, uh, in Singapore and elsewhere. It's certainly not established in the UK, um, but where employers can be incentivized um, through the taxation system and through essentially what we have with the, with the levy in a way in the UK um, to invest in upskilling and reskilling initiatives. Now, right now in the UK, that's very restrictive around the apprenticeship uh, levy. Um, and uh, my lifelong learning commission uh, that I chair, um, you know, has made recommendations on you know, how we can create those individual learning accounts and, and the tenant taking some of that forward now. Um, but how we ensure that we can truly incentivize employers to invest in the future of their workforces is absolutely vital. Um, and, and thinking about that tuition reimbursement model, thinking about that individual learning account model will not only help with funding, but it will also help with the cultural change that's required to show people why it's important and how they can get involved in learning beyond their 20s and 30s and, and, and really build up those skills that are required. Um, the third point is um, our view certainly um, uh, slightly uh, inconsistent with what, what Clara is saying, but but let's kind of add a bit of uh, add a bit of uh, difference to the discussion. Um, is that actually uh, stackable courses should be able to add up to the full degree, but assessment is a really crucial determinant of what takes us from micro credentials and stackable credentials right up to full degree programs and and the assessment piece is the bit that many universities are saying to us let's make that a little bit different um, and then fees and funding you know that has to shift it has to become more plural um, very quickly a couple of other brief points that i'll make um, and then let's uh, kind of leave time for a proper discussion so so number one is we need to make this more efficient carousel models which many of you will be familiar with are a very good way of enabling us to make learning and teaching uh, more efficient in these models, particularly online, where you can have different cohorts essentially starting at different times during the year. Um, and it's really important that we're aware of the fact that, you know, online students very often will want to study at a time and a place that suits them, um, making sure that the synchronous elements are more optional, or more flexible uh, to meet their requirements. Um, and crucially, um, ensuring that we have multiple intakes per year. These students are not prepared to wait until September or January to start their learning. And so ensuring that we've got flexibility in how we deliver and when we deliver is very, very important. And in terms of the private sector, I think the private sector has three core responsibilities. The first is in terms of bandwidth. Our universities are already stretched. We're already trying to do a huge number of things, um, but private sector partners who essentially become an extension of the institution that reflect and embrace the distinctive magic of its in, in individual institutional partners um, that really understand the culture uh, and the distinctive role that you, that university is playing can play a positive role um, in essentially being an internal catalyst um, in providing that bandwidth and support. The second is to provide expertise um, in how to deliver really powerful online experiences or really powerful micro-credentials or really powerful um, uh, you know, international uh, opportunities for students. Sometimes it's about marketing and recruitment. Sometimes it's about um, increasing the reach of these programs to students that wouldn't otherwise get access. Sometimes it's about building really powerful, immersive online communities. Um, and then the third criteria is about funding and capital and bringing those uh, alternative financing models uh, into, into play, I think is another role. But this has to be a win-win. Um, for public institutions and private organizations. It has to be on the terms of the universities themselves rather than them kind of you know, embracing something that might not be consistent with what they're trying to do. Crucially, it has to be a strategic initiative. Um, you know, where things get disjointed is where they don't work. Whereas actually, if you can find ways to deliver the internal strategy, the internal teaching and learning objectives, that's where um, things become powerful and, 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 and grow. Um, and crucially also allowing that change for the, for the changes that will come, allowing that flexibility for the changes that will come is also very, very important. The final point uh, that we always say is it has to be fully resourced for all parties. You know, um, it has to be properly supported within the institution. And crucially then the private sector partner has got to invest and got to make sure that it's delivering uh, its, its, its areas as well. Um, and where we can do that, you know, we can do really, really powerful things. Um, you know, one of the most exciting things I've found in the course of the last year or so is actually universities are pushing us rather than the other way around. Um, you know, I would never have imagined 
a conversation with Stephen Toop, the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge, uh, like the one that we had literally about a year ago, where we built the online strategy. We're now uh, uh, the institution just announced, uh, you know, these 50 short courses over the next five years, um, you know, the ability to train those 1400 academics, um, or institutions, again, um, uh, like UE Bristol, actually quite an interesting institution, where we're actually embedding micro credentials now into their full degree programs um, for the first time, and, and, and really exciting changes there, or the work with the LSE uh, to design degree programs on their behalf. Uh, in, in fully online and, and blended ways. Um, so really interesting to see the ways that institutions are saying, actually, you know what, we want to have a flexible conversation. Uh, and that's certainly, I think, the role that the private sector has to have, which is to be open and embrace that, um, but crucially to learn from you know, what's happened in the past and to make sure that this is a true win-win for all parties, that they're delivering real uh, added benefit for those institutions and crucially that we're part of a shared agenda to try and make sure that the changes that are coming and the evolution that we're all part of extends access, increases quality and make sure that our institutions continue to deliver world-class teaching and learning to millions more students around the world. Wonderful. Uh, Rajay, thank you so much. That's been a phenomenal um, sort of tour de force. Uh, and thank you so much also to, uh, for responding directly to, to, to Clara and Kuhn. Um, I, because we're running on in time, um, but really absolutely without any detriment to the quality of what we're doing, what I, could I really encourage all the panelists to engage with a very rich uh, debate that's developing on the Q&A section. So it'd be great if I could encourage you to kind of respond to the questions. There are a lot of uh, questions, many of them answered. Um, so please add your answer, but also some open questions, please add to those as well. Um, uh, and I would like to, to go straight to the second panel, and I hope that we'll have a, a, a a chance to, to let the speakers um, come in and there as well. Uh, Rosette, can I maybe start with you? Uh, and because uh, we've heard a lot about um, the, 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 the increased need for flexibility, for flexible learning, for flexible pathways, how the model is changing. And so I think it makes a lot of sense to go straight into practice. You are doing something brand new with, uh, uh, and we, we now have a number of different alliances, but you're doing something brand new with Utopia. Can you just tell us a little bit about how this flexibility is embedded in Utopia's teaching model? Thank you very much, Jan. And I'm really sorry to be squeezed between uh, two <laughs> engagements today, but 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 let's make the best of it. And, and I, I'm so glad with the, the talk of Rajai and the people from the, the European Union, because we, we, we really are trying to uh, use all these, uh, let's say, incentives and, and, and thoughts uh, by developing, in developing our model. So let me talk a little bit about Utopia and the learning communities that uh, we try to use to support uh, and uh, uh, create a potential, a potential for flexible lifelong learning across uh, borders. So we can go to the first slide showing the six partners in Utopia that uh, are in fact uh, typically open campuses. They organize numerous contacts with the cities and, and uh, the activities surrounding them. And it is from this openness that we in fact started developing the educational model. Uh, first, next slide perhaps. Um, yeah, we are in fact breaking down the walls, the, the traditional divisions uh, that, that are so characteristic inside, but also inside academia, but also between academia and, and the rest of society. Our connected learning communities, in fact, are organizing teachers, students, and actors in society society uh, in a connected way through active learning processes. We cooperate across disciplines, across institutions, and we are inspired by real life challenges. And uh, last but not least, uh, this all happens by using existing best practices in teaching, research, and outreach to society. You are perhaps not surprised that Joanne Gouri is also act, uh, acting as the curriculum developer of our educational model. Uh, let's look at a few outcomes of the pilot experiments that uh, we have been uh, building. Uh, and um, you see here the, the, the pyramid, the pyramid says it all. Uh, we, could, uh, we could explain, um, and that is then for more than 5,000 years the case, but it also goes for, for utopia. We start, in fact, in the, in the, in the 
broad basis of, of, of our pyramid, we start by selecting and identifying 30 cross-campus learning communities based on existing learning units. I'm, I'm, I'm really um, emphasizing this. And these units, they are part, they are curriculum components of our bachelor, master, PhD degrees. Uh, just as Rajai uh, also said, that we, they are integrated in, in the existing degrees. We don't have to organize or introduce something new for doing that. They cover a, a lot of exciting topics, I think, in a European context, so, such as European decision making, social change, multilingualism, critical data analysis, uh, analysis uh, sustainable geographical systems, etc., etc., etc. We are midterm now uh, of the pilot project, and uh, 18 out of 30 uh, learning communities are already operational and engaging in real activities with students and teachers in uh, the past academic year and in the coming uh, two academic years that are still, uh, let's say, within the pilot period of 1922. So what do we do? We start at the basis and we strengthen the learning the learning material of the uh, of, of the teachers uh, involved in 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 the communities by increasing, of course, the European awareness and the international research potential of academic staff and students and stakeholders to sustainable cross-campus networks. Uh, each learning unit. Um, uh, uh, reaches out to partners in the other universities and they come together in uh, the learning community, coming together being then in COVID times, of course, on virtual platforms. Um, it, let's not forget that we do not impose new topics or supplementary teaching load on our, uh, on our teachers. We recognize the innovative pedagogies and good practices that are in place in, in, uh, in our, on our campuses. And uh, these are recognized, identified by the highest authorities uh, uh, of uh, the, the, the Utopia partner universities. And this in itself is, is, is really a, a compensation for all the efforts that that are in fact uh, that are in fact um, organized, um, then this is perhaps the most important part in view of the potential for lifelong learning. Each connected community starts then creating recurrent, uh, intensive joint activities uh, designed for blended learning and including a variety of students that are already registered in our degree programs. Um, I'm, I'm just giving you one example because we don't have time for more, but uh, we invite our students from six, uh, from six countries to uh, be the national representatives during a simulation of international negotiations um, while um, uh, preparing the, digital, the, the EU Digital Services Act or some other new legislation. This is, of course, a, a, a very interesting way of, uh, of reaching out, not only to the model student that comes at university at 18 years old, but also to the professional or the citizen that wants to, be, that wants to know more about Utopia for professional or for other reasons. Um, by the, when we are at the top of the pyramid, we reintegrate all these new material, these enriched courses in our existing degrees. We don't have to create new degrees. We don't have to create new diplomas. We don't have to harmonize all kinds of legislation and rules uh, among, uh, across our campuses. They are just integrated in the existing curricula in an automatic way. And there they are, in fact, a continuous drive for internationalization and innovation of, of our curricula. And let's then look at the potential for, uh, uh, for lifelong learning. Uh, yeah, the next slide perhaps. Yeah, th this gives you a, a, an image of by the end of the pilot period, we will like have 30 Utopia uh, communities. We will involve 180 teachers at least. Uh, we will have 30 teaching assistants working for, uh, for the communities and uh, based on a selection of 30 
uh, students per uh, community, uh, six times five students uh, uh, picked out in, in, in the degrees of uh, on, the, on the different campuses, we'll, we will involve directly and directly 900 students in the test bed uh, experiments. Now let's look at, um, at the, the possibilities for lifelong learning because this is your topic today. As we said, these joint learning activities, engaging students, they are reintegrated and opened up to all our degree students that, that, are, that are related to, to these topics. But in a more autonomous way, we could start using these, these activities uh, like short-term learning efforts and uh, uh, develop a, a package that can be offered to, uh, uh, to lifelong learners in, in a very flexible way. Um, the, the blended uh, educational formats that we use and, and the short-term uh, kind of intensive uh, activities, they are especially uh, very su suitable for eliminating the barrier, the practical barriers that are related to conventional postgraduate uh, offering, typically going with mobility, registration, high registration costs, and long fixed periods in the academic year. This is not a flexible system. This is not uh, made for including uh, a, 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 wide, a wide range of, of lifelong learning learners that are uh, having all kinds of professional and uh, uh, other engagements uh, in, in their personal life. Um, so, so we really think that the connected learning communities could recognize these short-term learning efforts that, and it is also very, uh, uh, very important, they are short, they are intensive, but nevertheless, they are backed by the quality control of the full-fledged degree programs they are integrated in. So it is just a question of offering them in an autonomous way and uh, uh, let's say uh, at, at, at the next and parallel to the development of, of, of the degree programs. Um, the interaction uh, and, and the research-driven and challenge-based uh, pedagogical approach is, we think, very compatible with the experience and the maturity uh, uh, of, of, of lifelong learners. And last but not least, of course, all the, these lifelong learning uh, participants would get access to cross-European networks of fellow learners, of professional organizations, and of experts operating in the ecosystems related to the topics they, they have chosen. Let me uh, end uh, not by saying utopia solves it all, because this would be, I think, irrealistic and over-optimistic. But, but, but let me reflect a little bit, uh, and, and this is my last slide, uh, on some existential doubts, as I call them. It, it's it's, it's the, the panic <laughs> that now and then uh, arises when uh, you are an educator dedicated to, to academia, but when you, as, as I am, also trained uh, as an economist. Um, Utopia claims to offer good uh, chances for lifelong learning by using the connected communities framework for recognizing short term intensive learning activities and building also, of course, on the concept of the micro credentials. Uh, Utopia up till now worked in a very cost intensive way. You see a little calculus there and, and, and by the end we, we, we do all the good work per community per year for let's say an amount of uh, around 11,000 euro per community per year. Th this is extremely cost effective and, and the cost effectiveness is related to the integration of these experiments of course in existing degree programs and the cross subsidiation that goes along with it. Students are administered in the context of their registration in the home campuses and there is no need for complex bureaucratic systems related to harmonizations of national rules or institutional ha handling. But we will have a different story when this system will meet its limits by reaching out to a diversity of non-degree seeking students needing tailor-made information before and during the learning process, needing administrative follow-up to access, to, uh, to, uh, to, for acceptance, for assessment, for recognition of the lifelong learner. And this complexity will create 
supplementary workload for all involved, academic staff, administrators, technicians, the, the loss of them. And this cannot be uh, uh, compensated solely, I think, by primary funding, nor by well-intended European initiatives. For this kind of challenge, a coalition will be needed, and, and many of the speakers before me have already uh, uh, illustrated this. And we will need a well-taught contract-based uh, kind of, uh, uh, of arrangement based on the interests of all parties involved and uh, those that will benefit in the long and in the short run of lifelong learning. Students, academia, public authorities and actors in society. I think it is the absence of such a coalition that explains the poor results, we must be honest about this, of academia up till now in the area of lifelong learning and as illustrated very clearly by some uh, cross-national OECD study reports. So let's focus on, on this coalition and how to make it work and, and, and how to uh, fill in all the dimensions that are needed for qualitative work uh, that uh, I'm sure uh, academia can contribute to this process. Thank you very much, Jan, and very sorry to have thank you so uh, much to leave that. very soon. <laughs> thank you so much for that. It's been, uh, thank you also for picking up uh, Rajay's really point about how we resource this, you know, and how it's important that it's, it's really a win-win situation for everyone. I want to move straight on to Heli. Um, um, ECIU has um, just, I think, yesterday um, come out with a statement where I think uh, your uni university network uh, demands um, or really, really challenges the entire sector really to think of European universities as a, a model for micro credentials and that should be primarily, indeed only, I mean, I, as I if I said uh, correctly, about micro credentials. So, so uh, it's a really important challenge to all of us. So it's one, it's, it's incredibly timely to have you there, Heli. Um, and so you are, you are the, uh, the director of continuous learning at Tampere University. Um, and so I'm delighted to have you here. And, um, and, and really the floor is yours to really um, talk a little bit more about uh, your approach about how you want to change the academic model in a sense through micro credentials. Ellie, your sound. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. And uh, thank you for the previous, um, previous speakers for, for setting the scene in an excellent way. Um, let me start by saying that uh, we in ECI University believe that we need a systemic change in higher education, as it is stated in our vision 2030. Um, according to our vision, ECI University will be a European-wide open ecosystem of universities, public and private bodies, learners and citizens. It's not a traditional network of universities. Our aim is to create a challenge-based playground with entrepreneurship in our DNA. ECI University is all about co-creation and the European community. And lifelong learning is in the core of ECIU, um, also indicated by the choice that we do not go for standard joint degrees as a new European entity. All 12 ECIU member universities are research intensive universities and the goal is to integrate education, research and innovations in a novel way. In order to respond to the very fast accelerating new needs for skills and competences in the society, we need much more flexibility and agility in higher education. And when I talk about skills and competencies throughout the presentation, please do understand them in a very broad sense. All kinds of knowledge, skills, competencies, not only knowledge in a specific discipline. For ECI University, micro-credentials is a core element of a broader systemic change of higher education. And the systemic change might be best described uh, through the core elements that we need to work on towards flexible higher education and lifelong learning. Um, next uh, slide, please. Um, the first step towards the systemic change is the shift of focus towards skills and competencies. Currently, our focus is very much on degrees, it's on courses, it's on credits. However, in the end, 
they are all only packaging tools of skills and competence development. What has happened is that the tools have become our goals. That's what we measure, we measure the tools. Whereas in the end, it's skills and competences that should matter, no matter where, when, and how they are being developed. And as part of this shift, it's also clear that we need new ways of assessing skills and competencies reliably and transparently. The second element is comprehensive digital transformation, including effective use of data to support skills and competence development, use of new technologies such as AI, blockchain, etc. We need a thorough, high quality digital transformation in higher education. For ECI University, this is in the very core since our future business model relies heavily on data and digitalization. We in higher education should be also more interested in what individual learners truly need. This means that the first touch point of a learner with ECI University will not be a list of courses available. Instead, the first step is to analyze the current skills and competencies of the learner, understand his or her motivations and goals, and data and AI will play a crucial role here as well. And only once we understand the current situation of the learner, it's time to start thinking about what are the possibilities of developing the new needed skills and competencies? Courses or micromodules, as we call them, are only one opportunity. In order to fully harness the potential of higher education and life and learning, we need employer collaboration in a new level in a more proactive manner. We know that 70% of lifelong learning happens at workplaces, and we should be able to understand it all much better. Help make learning at work more visible and help make skills and competencies acquired at work transparent together with the employers and employees. Systemic change ultimately means that our position towards the rest of society will move from a transactional mode to relational. Higher education, particularly in the context of lifelong learning, is not about setting education available, but it's about co-creation and developing skills and competences in collaboration. And it also means that we as universities need to be willing to engage more openly into discussion with different stakeholders of the society and eventually all this means that higher education and lifelong learning need new business models. Resource-wise, we know that we need to do more and more in higher education. At the same time, particularly the public resources are not increasing at the same pace. We need to rethink where, where do the financial resources come from? What are the future revenue streams? And how do we use the resources in the smartest ways? And again, resource-wise, digital transformation plays a crucial role here. Next slide, please. So let me conclude by explaining how micro-credentials relate to all this. Micro-credentials is a tool that enables us to move forward towards the kind of world I just described, where the skills and competencies are in the core of learning for life in higher education. Through micro-credentials movement, we will develop digital competence passport. We will shift higher, higher education towards flexibility and agility, which leads to a more learner, or if you want a customer oriented approach of higher education, instead of the current more production and delivery oriented approach. Through micro-credentials, we engage ourselves into more intensive collaboration and co-creation with the rest of society and health employers. And micro-credentials, as we know, is not a property of higher education or educational system in general, but we believe that also other stakeholders in the ECIU university ecosystem should be able to provide micro-credentials with proper quality assurance measures, of course. And also micro-credentials force us to rethink the business models in higher education. In the future, we will not be paid only based on decrease produced. And finally, micro-credentials also develop synergies between research and education. They support the knowledge transfer by providing the latest research results quickly as learning opportunities. And I would like to finish by saying that new problems require new solutions. And for us in ECI University, it's micro-credentials. For us, micro-credentials are a part of the systemic change of higher education that we want to try for at the European level and naturally together with the member states. So I think I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this uh, really short and sharp and very much to the point uh, presentation. And I, I really expect that we'll come back to that uh, in, in, uh, at the end. Uh, Frederick, uh, can I just quickly turn to you? So you are part of the Microbowl project, which is really trying to 
bring in this revolution of micro-credentials to see to what extent that can be brought into the Bologna process. You're also very much involved in um, the, or, um, the, also rather in, as part of Enlight um, of the Enlight University Network, you're also involved in, in developing new approaches to flexible learnings. Can you just tell us a little bit more about, about those? Okay, yes, I'll do that with, with a lot of pleasure, Jan. And uh, thank you for the invitation. And also thank you uh, to the previous speakers and, and especially Halib for these thought-provoking ideas that you, you just brought up. Um, we have been lucky, I must say, in Flanders for the last couple of years, uh, ever since Bologna has infused into a legislation, it was um, made possible for us to deliver, on one hand, credit certificates for all courses, uh, uh, so, uh, on their own bachelor and master courses for which uh, students are successful. So these are a kind of micro-credentials. And we also have been able to deliver so-called certificates of competencies as the result of successful procedures for the recognition of prior informal and non-formal learning, uh, which gets increased attention now uh, because of the micro-credentials debate going on. And I think that's a very positive illusion as well. So we have had some experience. And even now, we never called these micro-credentials. They have, they have been around for quite a while. And by participating, as you said, in a microbot project, it became rapidly clear for me that the potential of micro-credentials uh, goes much beyond that. Uh, Microball is an Erasmus Plus uh, Key Action 3 project that focuses on the importance, as you said, of the Bologna Key Commitments for micro-credentials. So that means, first of all, ECTS and uh, qualifications frameworks. By the way, uh, Rajai, I think that ECTS is a real established and well-functioning credit framework. So I propose you have a good look at that. Uh, secondly, the Lisbon Recognition Convention and, and recognition in general uh, as, as a key commitment there. And last but not least, as already Clara indicated, quality assurance as, as, as the third and, and most probably most important key commitment there. And so uh, since uh, the work on the microball project coincided with the approval process internally at Ghent University for our new lifelong learning policy, uh, we immediately took the step to include th this concept in, in the creation of or in the implementation of our lifelong learning policy and so started to create new types of micro credentials, which are meaningful clusters, you could say, uh, of, or, of courses already existing in our bachelor and master programs. Uh, all in themselves, of course, leading to this credit certificates, but bundled together uh, because they, um, the overall set of the achieved learning outcomes has societal relevance. And I also would like to stress, like others have done, that this goes beyond the uh, utilitarian, purely skills-focused agenda there. So uh, as a university, we think we have a responsibility that goes beyond that. And so this kind of offer should on one hand cater for different target groups, and I think that's very important from an inclusiveness point of view. So uh, on one hand, for instance, professionals that already have some work experience uh, and, and, and have some specific upskilling and reskilling needs. Or 18 year olds uh, with a specific background who would like to get uh, a taste of higher education or refugee students with a lot of prior experience, but difficulties in getting access uh, to the labor market and, and needs. And on the other hand, I think that uh, looking at micro credentials from such a perspective allows these different types of students to work together with our so-called regular students. Uh, and I think that creates a very powerful uh, learning environment where intergenerational learning happens in an academic research-based setting with a strong link to real life, real life challenges and work-based experience, which is for me one of the main reasons why I in this field to really uh, not leave these behind. And in this way, micro-credentials offer us a conceptual entry and a common language as well to allow for better in interaction with external stakeholders and to take on as, as a university our societal responsibility, not only uh, from our traditional uh, degree-oriented research-based approach, but also from a lifelong learning perspective. And this means that uh, also in our regular, regular post-type offer, we are looking at applying the micro-credential standards, knowing that this might, of course, necessitate some major changes. For instance, more formalized quality assurance also in that post-type of learn lifelong learning offer. The use of uh, ECTS credits, uh, attaching a qualifications level 
to these lifelong learning courses, etc. So these are serious challenges. We have to be aware of that, and, and we are aware of that but we are at the same time sure that this will lead to more attractive better recognizable and easier transferable courses of a higher quality which is what we need to play a, a role in uh, lifelong learning as universities and as colleagues from other parts of the world i must say uh, for instance in asia have understood quite some time ago where, where they are uh, going through this shift in, in more and more countries and uh, universities which brings me to the question of what we within Europe and, and for instance, as, uh, within and light as one of the European universities, how we can uh, take on this uh, micro credentials agenda in our approach to flexible learning. And it is clear that one of our core ambitions as in light as a European university initiative is to develop the structural and technical framework for inclusive, seamless and green mobility in order to be able to provide uh, the, the tools for such flexible learning. And this means that we will have to remove barriers, cultural, psychological, administrative, linguistic barriers to stimulate students in engaging in, uh, in, in an international flexible learning experience. And a key success factor uh, for Enlight in achieving this will be the creation of an overarching competence framework. So also we take this focus on competencies and, and, and skills for so-called unlightable curricula uh, that guarantee the quality and the achievement of the envisaged learning outcomes. And so this framework uh, will indeed uh, be the basis uh, for this seamless movement within and between our nine universities and as such enhance flexibility to a large extent. And micro-credentials will, uh, we are only uh, one year further, uh, be incorporated in the strategy as an extra stimulus for learners and signposts to guide these learners through these flexible learning pathways. And so we are currently developing a policy paper on micro-credentials within Enlight, not only to feed into the current consultation that's going on, but also to stimulate internal discussion. So be because, and, and this for me, makes the debate on micro-credentials so interesting. Many people understand many different things when they hear the concept micro-credentials. And this debate in itself is very stimulating and contributes to the diversity and flexibility of our higher education landscape, as today's initiatives for which I applaud the Guild very clearly proves. Thank you uh, very much. Alexander, before I turn to you, can I just bring in Kuhn and, and Clara just, just uh, very briefly, because I think there's, there's a question um, that, that, that's really come up in sort of behind a number of these issues. Um, um, and that's really raised by Elizabeth uh, Blagrove in the, in, the, in the chat here, which is really about the, uh, the question when we, you know, are we really talking about a c custom or consumer oriented model emerging in this, in this kind of transformation? So, so are universities there to, to, um, to be in a marketplace effectively along with other providers? Um, or is there something that, that emerges out of the d disciplines? I mean, is, can you talk a little bit more about the push and pull about how you see um, the role of universities here? Yes, if I, if I may start, I would say it is more the, uh, I, I would like to see it more as a learner centered uh, model of, uh, uh, of, of higher education uh, uh, rather than, than, than the customer, but uh, uh, really looking at what uh, the learner needs in order to acquire uh, the skills and competencies which are needed for him or her in the current uh, society and the ad adjustments uh, to that. So in, in that sense, I would like to join uh, to uh, hey uh, um, uh, vision of, uh, uh, of, 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 of the models. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Kun, do you want to add on this? Yeah, Clara, I think not specifically on universities, but I think what we are doing at, at commission level is indeed to, to support also that learner-centered work through tools that we are developing. And in this context, uh, I think that we have the potential to develop, to develop also, let's say, the, the Europass further, because it will uh, provide uh, um, core suggestions on the basis of a skills profile. We are not very strong currently, but this will be uh, developed because the more people will have an e-profile and 
in, in Europass and put their skills in Europass. And we are currently close to 2 million people who have done this. Europass has much more information available. And we will also have another development that is namely to link information on skill strengths. And also there is a project going on by the uh, agency in Thessaloniki on vocational training that is uh, looking at uh, online uh, vacancies and you know observing the skill trends that you can see in these online uh, vacancies mm. and this is information of which the purpose is that it is becoming available we are not there and um, yeah I think this helps the, the learner center because the learner needs and this is what Frederick said and I also very much liked uh, Haley's intervention the learner needs to be somehow uh, guided and um, another element that we will build in uh, to Europass uh, because obviously it's, it's work in progress is also um, an online tool that will also support some some guidance yeah for um, yeah career guidance we'll call it but it will equally be guidance for learning and I, I must say that's very much the the red also in EU policies is a focus on skills and competences and um, that it doesn't matter when and where and how you uh, acquired, uh, acquired them and in this context I would like to just and this is my, my last short sentence refer now to the council recommendation that also exists from 2012 on validation of non-formal and informal learning which we are so in my team uh, really uh, yeah monitoring how how that is implemented across across europe Thanks. thank you Colin. and, and i have sorry clara i've got to come back to you very briefly with this question from monique share if we think about these embedding micro credentials european university alliances how can we avoid effectively this all being in english right i mean across these alliances doesn't that really and, and how doesn't that really include masses of lifelong learners across the European Union? Sorry, this is from Monique Scher, who is the vice vice rector at the University of Tübingen and in Civis. Yes, uh, we we uh, we see that uh, European universities alliances many uh, of them are reflecting on on uh, the need to, to increase uh, multilingualism uh, in uh, within their uh, alliances and. Uh, uh, it will be certainly not an easy uh, uh, step, but uh, uh, one which uh, which is worth trying and which is linked to uh, developing uh, language competences of uh, of the learners uh, um, already from the beginning of uh, or from earlier on. So not not necessarily in, in, in higher education, and uh, um, yeah, perhaps uh, there uh, there will be. Uh, there will be possibilities to offer uh, the, the, probably the, even the same uh, uh, course, but uh, in uh, with different tracks or, or with different uh, languages, mm -hmm. or, or in a in a multilingual way uh, where everybody is allowed to to choose uh, uh, from from some languages which are widely understood in the community. So, uh, the, but but this is indeed indeed something where where we expect a lot of uh, input uh, and suggestions mm -hmm. from alliances. Mm -hmm the basis of their experimentation. Good. One sentence, because I've got to move on to Alexander, but yes. One short sentence yeah. on this is to say that the Europass platform is available in 29 languages. It's underpinned by the ESCO qualification, also on skills, and that also exists in, I believe, currently 26 languages. Great. So this is supporting learners of all languages. Thank you, Cohen. Um, and that was an important addition. So, uh, Alexander, you've been extraordinarily patient, um, but uh, you are here um, from the University of Rijeka. I hope I've pronounced this broadly okay. Um, you're the UFI Instant Institutional uh, Coordinator, the Young University uh, for the Future of Europe Alliances, uh, Alliance, and you are the Student Journey Work Package Co-Lead. Um, and so, uh, Alexander, the floor is yours. We really look forward to your um, a uh, short presentation before we then move to uh, final discussion. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I see that uh, that that the arrangement on the slide is a little bit uh, uh, like shuffled, but hopefully it will be okay uh, in the next slide. Uh, so thank you for the introduction um, and hello everyone. Uh, just to just to briefly mention uh, the, the the plan for this very 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 brief outlook from our side. Uh, I will combine here a kind of a personal and organizational uh, perspective, the organization of being UFES of our European University Alliance and uh, my personal since uh, 
Uh, I've been a student representative for quite so many years at all levels from the local uh, here actually at the university to the European level and the European Students Union. And I will therefore also try to uh, speak about this uh, uh, in terms of what we used to uh, advocate for in the student movement when we uh, uh, kind of uh, advocated for, for flexible learning. But to kick off, just a very few very broad points on why do we even need this flexible uh, type of learning. Obviously, this is not ex uh, exhaustive in, in, in any case, but just a couple of uh, main points. So first of all, and this is for me the, the basis that different learners have different needs. This is what the other speakers have uh, right now actually referred to in this term of learner centeredness. And actually, if we don't uh, have uh, our education in, in a manufacturing line style, this flexibility maximizes the benefits overall. And that actually leads to, to the second point, uh, which is that this more individual approach is actually connected with accessibility. Because we can actually uh, capture, let's say, a more diverse group of learners in this way. And that also fosters inclusion. And finally, the, the, the third point is uh, very important to what we have also heard today from the previous speakers uh, about kind of future proofing uh, our competences. And that is that even if theoretically, it will not be, but theoretically, uh, if you, you could convey the same competences in a more flexible and individualized environment and in a more traditional learning environment, the first will still be preferable because the learners along their their uh, uh, learning journey acquire these meta competences of autonomy, confidence, and responsibility for their own learning, which which prepares them for um, for a world which is uncertain, which constantly changes, and we need to equip them to learn continuously throughout their life. So these were just the the, the benefits that we are uh, expecting, and uh, in the in this next part, I'll just briefly go to what uh, from my personal experience as i said uh, i have um, kind of and in, in communication with my colleagues when i used to be a student representative what what we advocated for and what we saw that the students want in terms of flexible learning and i'll reflect here on just a couple of very practical uh practical things on the let's say ground level of education in everyday student life and the first thing is that I would mention is recognition of informal and non-formal learning. And often we talk about it in terms of uh, um, enabling uh, access, in terms of uh, recognizing for entry qualifications. But what I want to emphasize here is that this also needs to be complementary to the more formal educational program. And here I think is a, is a significant connection to, to the, the issue of micro-credentials, even if it's in the same institution. The same institution, if it's a higher education institution, obviously offers more structured formal study programs, can also offer uh, micro-credentials, let's say, as part of the lifelong learning program. But I see no reason not to try to integrate those two. Uh, this would be a recognition maybe of more non-formal learning, uh, but th then also to acknowledge learning by doing and allow students to replace a certain number of their ECTS points by their informal learning. Flexible and diverse learning methods. Here we refer more to the to the pedagogical side of it. I think you are uh, very well aware of that. And uh, but what I think is very important is to add to it these flexible assessment methods. Now we only know that obviously the learning uh, uh, learning methods and tools need to be aligned with the assessment methods. But still, in this uh, in this drive towards flexibilization of higher education. Uh, I, I think that we are much more reluctant to flexibilize on the side of assessment methods, and this may be natural because we don't want to renounce control over what is essentially a verification of competences, but still, uh, still we need to achieve flexibility in that regard as well. Now, flexibility in program design for students, uh, obviously what we need is uh, enough, uh, uh, let's say uh, that the elective parts of the program need to be uh, 
strong enough or strongly represented enough. Because in this way, not only do we allow um, uh, students to, to better fulfill their, their own interests, but we also create more diverse and more refined even uh, sets of graduates. We do not have uh, e completely equal competency profiles, but we actually allow the graduates to distinguish themselves, which is also good in terms of the labor market inclusion, because we also allow the students to explore certain niches. And obviously the recognition of credits from abroad, which even after all these years and even decades, uh, we, we are still obviously being faced sometimes with, with obstacles to uh, proper student mobility. I just put here the map of the uh, UFA European University, our academic and non-academic partners, um, just to emphasize this, uh, this part about uh, mobility. So this is uh, what I think are, are the valuable uh, practical goals. And uh, now finally, I'll just try to present to you how UFA tries to make this flexible learning environment uh, a, a reality for its students. Now, the first and most obvious point, and certainly we have been strongly nudged uh, into this direction by the, the current pandemic circumstances, is uh, uh, the, the, not only the taking of online and physical courses, once we, we kind of restart physical mobility, hopefully in the next semester already, <clears throat> but also to combine them. So meaning that even in the same semester, we will allow students to engage in physical mobility at another institution, but also to, uh, to take some virtual courses at perhaps a third or fourth or fifth institution, creating what is in essence a multilateral uh, mobility experience. Combining academic and non-academic aspects uh, of learning. Uh, so what we try to kind of, uh, how we try to guide our, our students, our first round of students already uh, is that they are not in higher education only for what is here in the upper left corner, uh, the academic courses, or maybe also the language courses, but that there's a whole set of what we at least called a non-academic aspect, which is more practical experience and which is closer to what I mentioned earlier in, in like setting the goals as informal learning. We want the students to be learning through practical experiences. Now, that can be intracurricular, which is desirable, uh, and that is what I wanted to emphasize by the uh, example of recognition of informal learning. So an example would be if a student uh, does a certain activity in an, in an NGO, we kind of recognize the learning outcomes achieved there, and we allow a student to replace certain part of their program. However, even if, when that is not possible for any reason, the, the student should be able to uh, kind of give like an informed uh, uh, agreement, the informed consent to uh, to actually engage in these experiences beyond their regular course workload and beyond their regular uh, ECTS. Again, this uh, allows the students to ma uh, to maximally fulfill their interest in their education, in their higher education. And finally, this is the last slide, but something that I uh, that I think is the most important uh, to, to, to share uh, today, and that is the individualized outcomes or reward system. Um, and here you can see the scheme. So basically, and this is something that we will test out from the beginning of next semester. So basically, the approach that we want to take here is to offer certain elements we, we, we kind of, so the first thing that we do is um, kind of differentiate or dissect uh, the, the learning offer into what we would call in atomic requirements, so the, the lowest uh, unit of learning. And this is represented here on, on the slide by these different shapes, the star, triangle, uh, circle, etc. And then we offer this to students uh, as a, basically as a menu, maybe that can be used as a metaphor. It's a, it's a menu and the students then choose from the menu which units they want to engage with. Depending on the combinations that they take, it leads to different outcomes. 
So here at the top, you can see, for example, if they just take a single activity, maybe they just take a course or two. So let's say that's a star, uh, that would be one type of outcome. But maybe they just want to uh, get, uh, get engaged with um, some extracurricular activities, like maybe some internships, volunteering, things like that. Let's say that this is a triangle. That would be the second outcome. But then you can see how, how what happens if they combine these things, uh, how these things fit together, and that leads them to different outcomes. And importantly, this is, I think, the crucial uh, thing that we are trying to achieve is that these are not predefined at the beginning. So in the moment that a student joins the program, they don't have to choose what the outcome will be. They join the program, everything is offered to them, and then we will see, depending on the choices that, that the students make, what the outcome will be. Now, we don't call these, uh, these units of learning uh, micro-credentials, although, although there are um, a lot of similarities, and we are planning some, something much more similar to micro-credential system in the future, but I thought it would be too early to, to, to uh, talk about that, because these are really long-term uh, long plans. So, but this scheme, in essence, is what is the uh, what what is the, the basic uh, demonstration of what we are trying, what we are intending to do with this indi individualized uh, outcomes system. So that would be it from me, in, in very briefly. So thank you. That's uh, that's wonderful, Alexander. Thank you so much for for this uh, really uh, enlightening presentation um, to 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 end end this uh, end series of presentation on a high note. Um, just to everybody's uh, watching this, uh, catching up with this event on YouTube, there is uh, there has been a live uh, debate on in the question and answer session um, in the question and answers here, uh, um, and you can catch up with this uh, discussion uh, in in our Padlet um, uh, for the, that we have for this event and for future events. So please uh, check check there as well to 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 keep informed about what what the issues are and we will continue with with this debate um in a longer format um in in due course this has clearly been an incredibly important uh, taster but there's clearly huge demand to um to uh, um continue the discussion and uh, joe anguri tells me joe maybe if you can come in you tell me that you've uh, you've you've been uh, active on on linkedin and other social media fora um, as as the session has continued do you just have some final reflections joe for 90 seconds <laughs> okay, nine seconds. Uh, uh, so first of all, thank you very much, and and, and thank you, Rita, for grasping it uh, and 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 communicating the need for uh, continuing this. Uh, I've received quite a lot uh, during during the seminar about the need to actually have a longer debate. So uh, we will we will follow up. Uh, I think to me, just in 90 seconds, uh, what we've demonstrated uh, is both the complexity, but also the opportunity uh, to really use experience. We don't want to throw the baby with the bathwater. We have, we do a lot of things very well. We have a lot, enormous experience. A number of colleagues are saying how many successful and less successful projects we've learned from over the years. We need to translate this uh, to policy and policy recommendation and we need to really connect it uh, to the fundamental issue of what it means uh, for uh, the funding models for education for resource for the whole way of organizing uh, our academic practice uh, I, I cannot think uh, of a time where uh, at, at least that that is definitely what i can say from uh, all my uh, all, all my adult life uh, which is all has in, in academia and I cannot think of a time where there has been uh, so much discussion, emphasis from international and national uh, policymakers uh, on the transformative, on the transformative potential in education. Uh, I, I think Raj, I agree very much with the sort of the accelerating effect that COVID was an accelerant, has been, is an accelerant, and that gives us an opportunity really to reflect on what is important and what we do well. Uh, both in terms of the digital, non-digital, the face-to-face, -face, what we value, how we learn, but also the really the opportunity to improve uh, what we know uh, we can do better of by drawing uh, on uh, on the experience, the evidence, and the skills we have. 
Uh, and what I've also had, I was making notes uh, uh, sort of uh, for, for a possible discussion, which we don't have time today, but it will follow on maybe, I think there's definitely space for really a round table on this as to how we actually envisage, how we see this ecosystem, this learning ecosystem, and, and, and particularly on the lifelong learning, the different providers uh, back to the higher education, ed tech, academic and other societal actors coming together in this sort of coalition, this partnership and co-creation, what this would actually look like and what are this, uh, the implications. And, and the implications is that we also need to balance discipline training with interdisciplinarity and also not lose sight of all the things we do well in degree programs because degree programs also embed active learning and, and, and also provide a very important uh, part of what we need for educating for the future. So um, I think coming, I think we really raised the issue and part of the insight paper was the first part was to raise the issue and start uh, moving towards a roadmap of change with solutions. And I think that's definitely what we need as our next step. Uh, the sort of a longer event where we're really going to take all the debate, which has been absolutely fascinating in quality and spot on, uh, on the Padlet and really turn this to round tables where we can put on the table how exactly we do it, what are the specific and tangible solutions or paths or steps uh, that we would want to see in our institutions and what this would look like because of course we are in a very diverse uh, ecosystem ourselves. Um, that was probably more than 90 minutes but yeah. I can see Jan is really taking the floor so I'm going to stop now. Thank you Jan. Thank you, Joe. But uh, but in those uh, two times ninety seconds, you already uh, you already did my summary for me, which is wonderful. So thank you very much. Uh, all that I have therefore to do is is the honour of thanking the panel, thanking all the very rich, thanking you for the very rich um, uh, contributions that you've made. I want to uh, thank all of our um, all of our contributors in the Q and A and on the Padlet. Um, please keep the discussions on the Padlet uh, going uh, over not just over the next few hours, but really over the next uh, half year and, and, and beyond. Uh, we will be back first of all. We will be back on the twenty third of September um, uh, at at Aarhus, and so please uh, join us for that in this continuing debate. And it's really all these are key aspects, not just for for universities, but really of the European higher education. Um, uh, area and of the European education area. So um, uh, thank you very much for um, joining us. I wish you a fantastic summer and we really look forward to uh, continuing the discussion um, uh, after the summer break. Thank you.